shout out to everyone that's joined us. As I always do, where are you hollering from? Los Angeles, we got LA in the house, we got India, we got Austria. Thanks for joining us. I'm sure more people will come along as we, as we rock and roll. Today we have Kojo, who is a musical director. And I came into this session naive, right? I did it purposely because I'm like, you know, the less I know, the more I will ask. Now I kind of got a vague idea about what his role is. I definitely know the portfolio is wild. We've also got Lee here who, who runs our music industry management course. He's prepped a few questions to get the ball rolling. Kojo, I'm gonna throw you in the spotlight now. Do you know what? I wanna just ask a real silly question before you get into it. Mm-hmm. Obviously I'm hearing that kind of Atlantic accent. Whereabouts in the, are you, he's from the States, right? Yeah, you know what? It's kind of weird. Basically, I'm originally from Los Angeles, but I've lived um, in the UK for many years now. So I kind of, I, I, I'm based out of the UK and work out of the UK and this is home for me. So, so you, you don't go into, into the bars and clubs and still be like, how many dollars is that? You are- Nah, 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 nah. It's confusing because people sometimes, they hear it's like a weird transatlantic, they're not sure where I'm from, but I've, I'm, I'm essentially, I've grown up in the UK and been here for many years, but the accent just hasn't completely gone. Well, well, you know, Janelle's here. She's from LA too. So we got two LA people up in the nice. house representing West Coast in the house, baby. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so Kojo, man, right, that, you know, give us a little bit of background, man. What, what's good? What, what, what is your role? How did you get into it? Like, give us a little bit about your journey, my man. Man, all right. So I work now as a music director. I work with artists on their live shows. So a good summary, what a music director's role is, is to transfer a recorded piece of music into a live performance piece of music. So my role is everything to do with that. It could be as simple as how do you perform somebody's record in an acoustic sense to how do you do an award show version of that song or how do you do an hour and a half show. It's everything related to that. So that's down for finding the right personnel. That's arranging the music to kind of suit a live context. People sometimes think, why do you need a live arrangement? But it's, it's, a different, it's a different experience. A record is like something that's recorded and lives in a particular moment in time. But a live performance has to be alive. It has to breathe. It has to do something different. So the way you arrange music for a live performance might be completely different to what works in um, on record. Um, so you need somebody to kind of translate that because the experience is different. And my role is to kind of do the right thing at the right time. So what that means, so for example, if somebody's performing with a live band, at one point in time, the right thing to do might be to make it sound exactly like the record. Because let's say it's a new artist, it's a new song, people don't want you messing around with their record. You know what I mean? It needs to be what it is. But let's say you're six months down the road or a year down the road and an artist has been performing that song for a year, they're doing a festival. It has to be something else because people have heard the song on the radio a zillion times, whatever. It has to breathe. You have to bring, you have to arrange it in different ways to make it interesting, to keep it interesting for the artist, to keep it interesting for the fans. So the role is to kind of like be a part of that process, getting the right musicians involved, the right arrangements for the right times, and anything to do with what that artist performs. So that's what a music director's role is. Can, can I ask as well, because I mean, one of the things I want to know is how you found yourself in that role, but I'll get to that in a minute, because what you said triggered a whole range of thoughts for me. Sure. Personally, I'm a massive fan of like hip hop. Yes. And, you know, as the trends have changed from like the 90s when I was really loving it to now, Mm -hmm. is you hear a lot more vocal effects on an artist now. Before you kind of, artists would just go in, spit on the beat. Now, when I listen to a record, even if you think about Kanye West as a great example where you have that initial album like College School Dropout where it's kind of just his voice. And then you've got um, Heartbreak, oh, the name escapes me. 808s and Heartbreaks. 808 and Heartbreak, where all of a sudden it's like, so much is going on with the vocal and it's changed. And a lot of artists are going down that route. So I think to myself, you can't just do that live. You can't just walk into a venue and, and deliver that. That requires technology to make your voice sound like that. Are you involved in that part of the process? So that's a good case study. So for instance, if I'm working with 
a rap artist. And recently I've worked with a few UK based rap artists, people like Stormzy, Dave, AJ Tracy, people like that. It's like, they'll come to you with the record and it's like, how are we gonna do this? <laughs> it's literally, th th that's the question, that's the discussion. How are we gonna make this work live? So it might just be a case of maybe somebody just wants to rap on top of their kind of auto-tune parts, or they might wanna use auto-tune live. So it's like, if, 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 I, if I think to myself, well actually, do you know what? Let's say that particular hook, we just leave, we just leave the backing track on there and you just rap on top. That's, that, might, that might be one way to go, but another way might be to actually set it up so that you actually perform it as you did on the record. So therefore, it's my job to make sure we have a, a, you know, a live auto-tune rig set up. You know? So that has to be a part of the actual production. So, but it's not even a point of me facilitating that. We have to make the decision of how we're gonna perform these records. Are we gonna do it exactly like the record? Are you just gonna spit the bars and it just be like your voice? Are you gonna not have? So usually, but I would say in that scenario, Auto-Tune Live has now become a very regular part of live shows and not just for rappers, for singers too. Okay, I thought as much. Now, that I, I know I'm concentrating on this particular niche and we will broad out. And also I, I wanna use this juncture to remind the students as well, the people that are in attendance. Please populate the chat with your questions. I will go through and ask some of those as well, if anything occurs to you. So if there's anything you want to ask, Kojo, please use the chat to um, put your question. But Kojo, what I was going to say is, I've noticed like the prevalence of that now in terms sure. of the music I listen to, like sure. everyone wants to sound like T-Pain. So it's just like every art, there's very, I find there's less artists now that don't have those kind of view, um, effects on their vocal than there are artists that, that, that go pure without it. So my thought is that, does that increase the demand in, in terms of what you guys do? And, and has it become much more of an essential part of live performance? Okay, well, I'll put it to you like this. It's like, that's an aspect of what I might need to do. So for example, you don't need a music director for you to use auto-tune live. You can, you, know, you can have a playback tech and sort that out. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's not, that's a technical thing that can be done. But what you need a music director for, or what some might need a music director for, is it's the other things. It's like, for example, like, you know, you can't just have a stereo backing track. I mean, a lot of people do it, <laughs> you know what I mean? but if you want to do it at a high, if you want to perform at a high level, that means you're also, you know, working with production teams who are also doing fancy graphics and lighting and things like that. There's certain things that have to be, so for example, I might need to work from the stems. Do you know what I mean? It can't just be like a stereo backing track. We're, we're, I'm, I'll prepare a show for a rap artist in the same way I would with a live band. I'll take the stems, I'll break it down, I'll make sure the front of house has drums, bass, music, vocals, everything separate. Lead vocal, that needs to come out so that you can hear the rapper spit. Maybe, you know, there'll be a track for the auto-tune. Th like, things of that nature have to be kind of facilitated, but also as well, it's like, if there's not a band involved, it's like, okay, how are we gonna make this show interesting? How are we gonna make this an actual show and not just what I call like a Spotify show? Do you know what I'm saying? Like anybody can just come up and go track to track to track to track. You know, it's like, it's a music director's job if somebody wants one to actually then make it interesting, make an intro to the show, segue to songs, choose a set list that works, make sure that one song goes into another in the right way. It might need to be interludes, it might need to be other things to make it a performance and not just playing songs back to back. A lot of shows have, you know, are like that and they're kind of just like, they're kind of whack really to me. Do you know what I mean? It's just like, I call them Spotify shows. It's like, who can't do that? Who can't just go up and play songs back to back? So it's kind of like, you know, your job is to make it not just a collection of songs, to make it an interesting performance. And that might be doing a very little bit, or it might be doing a whole load, you know, so that's... So I, I'm thinking now about certain iconic performances. Um, Adele, she did mm -hmm. something very stripped back and everyone remembers. Dave's performance quite recently, I think it was at the Brits, was yeah, like, yeah. was something that every, really stood out. And that was like a really strip, stripped down thing and very different from how it was originally delivered on, on, on the record, on the record. I think what, what it makes me realize is the, like, the performances, when you're trying to make something that stands out, we change our performances drastically to, 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 give, to give new context. And that's a creative process, it's very creative. How much of that is the artist's choice and how much of that lays with you? Or does it depend on who you're working with? It, it totally depends on the artist. Some people 
have more ideas than others. Some people want you to give them ideas, but ultimately, my view on it is it's it's the artist show. It's a collaboration. The, one of the things I like about music is that it's it's a it's a team sport. You know, everybody has to be involved. For me, my job is to facilitate helping the artists fulfill their vision on a live stage. Now, if that that to some degree that might just be letting, figuring out a way to do whatever it is that they want to do. Another, for another artist, that might be giving them a bunch of ideas and a bunch of things. They might just want a lot from me, do you know what I mean? To help them make decisions. So it's, it kind of depends on artist to artist, but um, it should be, you know, it's, it's a collaboration. I see it like MDN is like producing a band. So it's like in the same way, if an artist is working with a producer, you're working with them to create something special and you're both a part of it. So it's like, you know, they might have an idea, you might have an idea. They might have an idea, you might have an idea. And that's just a part of it. So it's, it's a collaboration. Lee, I know you're, you're, you got, you've got a few questions in the pipeline. Just itching here, man. You know, no, but I know, I know. <laughs> he even came at me on the sideline like, T, come on, man. let me yeah. know. I've got, I've got a couple more already, Kojo. So, cause I want to know about your entry point in and okay. also, and also I want to know the techie stuff, like in terms of software that's involved in terms of actually executing, but we'll get to that. What I just wanted to ask, I know it's really hard to summarize, but if you can go back to when you started out in music and you, you know, considered yourself to be a keyboard player mm. and a producer from that point um, in regards to sort of gaining experience, I know you can't, kind of fit in 25 years of stuff in like a couple of minutes answer but were there specific points where you saw yourself go from just those two things and then suddenly you had another title to add to your list because of skills that you developed you might not have known that you were developing those skills to become something but suddenly people are asking can you do these things and you go actually I can because you sure. built up so you know in regards to people that are in the audience today that are starting out now, just kind of, if you can explain a little bit about your experience of starting off and then maybe a few points that changed your direction. Sure, um, yeah, it's a really good question. I think that it's really important to be able to do lots of different things um, because throughout a career, there might be varying different lanes that you're gonna have to go through at different times if you want to do it long term, you know, it's like, an average career might be four, five, six, seven, eight years in the music industry. So if you want to do it over a long period of time, you might find that you're doing lots of different things. So yeah, I'll talk to you a little bit about how things went for me in my career. I grew up in a musical family, so I was always around instruments, and I just started playing as a teenager, as you would. But, you know, it was, at the, it was at a time when technology, or home technology, was really becoming a thing. So um, I quickly went into production. That seemed to be something that I was into. And I, I spent my whole sort of teen years basically trying to make music and play music and make music and play music. I did a few keyboard sessions as a young sort of musician, as you do. So do you um, mean like sessions? Yeah, like regular kind of sessions. But usually it would be somebody comes by my house they hear something, they say, oh, you can play, will you come do this session? And I did a few things like that. And quite frankly, like after doing a few sessions, I was like, fuck this, I'm not doing this. Cause I just felt like, cause basically I didn't realize it, but I'd actually been developing as a producer. So when I would go into studios, even though I was like 18, 19, 20 or whatever, I knew more than the people in the studios because um, I didn't realize how little people knew. <laughs> Basically, I would be working with these guys that were producers that were sort of maybe 10 years older than me thinking that they knew all this stuff only to realize, wait a second, I've been doing this for years. I know how to do this. And I just kind of quickly thought, well, you know what? I'm going to go the production route. So um, in short, I did everything that you're supposed to do as a young producer, which is, you know, get good at your stuff, work with artists, got management, you know, publishing deals, remixes, records, album cuts, blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. Obviously that's shortening it, but I did, you know, if, if you're a producer, that's the stuff you want to do. You want to start getting cut, you want to do mixes, you want to get a deal. I did all that stuff. After doing that for maybe 10 years or so, 10 to 15 years, I think I kind of got a little bit burnt out. I'd been in the studio practically every day for as long as I could remember on this project or that project, or this project or that project. 
I had moved to the States and um, I had a bit of a down period and I started doing music for film and television actually. So I had maybe like a three, four year period when I kind of pretty much did that exclusively. Can I just ask you a question at that point? Because obviously when, when we hear sort of people's stories, obviously, you know, you'll kind of jump from one thing to the next. But it's even things like when you kind of said uh, people would come around and hear stuff. So in my head, it's like, well, that means you must have built up a natural network of people who were coming around and listening to stuff. And then your name maybe grows outside of that by people saying you should hear what code is in. And then also you said, I started writing for, you know, for, for, you know, TV and film. It's like obviously people don't just start doing that. So I'm assuming, I'm just detecting throughout this, throughout this time, you're developing a massive network of people that must work in all sorts of areas. Well, I think that, yeah, I think that basically, so, I, okay, so using those two as examples. So like, obviously when you, when you, well, you know, when you make music, you, you speak to other people that make music or you make music with other people that make music and, things kind of like grow kind of exponentially. I think that um, maybe, I don't, yeah, I think that maybe I, I knew, so, I can't remember how I started knowing people now I think about it. People at school, friends, people know people, they say you have, hey, this guy makes good music, oh, let me hear it, let's send it. Just like really quite naturally, some of the first gigs that I had done, I think I remember I was playing with some friends who then knew this guy that was doing that was a bit further down the line and needed a keyboard player and I kind of went and did it and I think maybe people would come to shows and they would know the person and oh this guy's a DJ he needs a keyboard player or this you know you just start I think just in a town like London the more you do you naturally start meeting different people and I think that that's kind of how most of that happened I think like I said with regards to then actively starting producing it was a situation where I had demos from just local bands or local people that I did stuff with. A friend of my mom's was managing, it started managing a boy band. We were around the same age. They thought, let's put them together in a session, you know, started doing that. <laughs> you know, it was kind of going good. Then, you know, they got signed and you just, I just, I guess natural kind of steps with things. So you just kind of, you get into the game, don't you? So actually, you know, just to sort of take from what you're saying, and definitely not everyone that I know works in the music industry, not everybody busts their ass. I think some people think it's going to come to them because I've written some good songs, for instance. But oh. from what you're saying, it's like, it's, you know, dedication, hard work, and then a lot of the organic stuff starts happening, i.e. you build a network naturally, that your name gets out there naturally because you're active, you're creative. 100%. You have to bear in mind, I'm, I'm forgetting shit that we used to do because I'm forgetting the fact that, you know, it's, a, it's a, it was such a different time then, but it's like, you know, you would download, or not download, because you didn't have download, and you would get acapellas from records, you would do remixes of them, you would send them to radio stations, you would send them to DJs, you would press up vinyl, like you would do all that. That's just what everybody did because that was the only way you got your stuff kind of you know, out there, do you know what I mean? So I was always doing that kind of stuff. That was just a part of what you did. But I think the key thing with all of that is that whenever you're doing anything in music, it has to be good. That's the thing, you know, nobody's gonna notice it if it's not good. But if you're doing something that's good, even if somebody just tells their cousin and then their cousin tells another cousin, somebody's cousin is in the music business and is looking for people to collaborate. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? It's just the way it is. Do you yeah, know yeah, yeah, yeah. Particularly I feel like if there's it's a running theme here, and I just I like to, I, I like to intervene at this juncture because I do a lot of one to ones with students. My role is about career and engagement. Mm. Overall, the big question is, you know, how do I make it in the music industry, or I want to do this for a living, or how do I do it? Just listening to what you were saying, I feel like you can't rely purely on talent. Oh, hell no. Because so like like you said, it has to be good, but don't rest on your laurels just because it's good. Because from what I gather there, from what you're saying is you were putting yourself out there. You were you were attending gigs, even if you were like, well, this might not be for me. And I think you came up from an era where social media wasn't the most powerful tool. It, it, it wasn't a tool. <laughs> I'm, exactly. I'm, I'm old. <laughs> for all the advantages it brings, what it might have detracted from a lot of people now entering the music industry is we maybe sometimes lose the importance of what it is to be in a physical space, meet people and generate actual 
forge general rapport and relationships with people that can really help your career. So I'm always talking about with people, and it's hard because of COVID, obviously, but I'm always talking to people about turning up at gigs, going to going to the places, in being in the physical space where the scene that you want to occupy exists, because then you're going to meet someone that will be part of your career path. I think that it's just like, I mean, look, at the end of the day, like, you know, socials are great in the sense that it gives people like, you can have a direct access to people and you can build relationships. It's just, you just have to do it the right way. I would definitely say it's much easier now than it would have been, you know, for me back, back when, but you still have to do it the right way. And I think that what sometimes people get wrong is they actually think that, oh, well, because I can just hit somebody up on social media, that, you know, I've got the key. When it's like, well, no, because if you hit somebody up and what you got is whack, it's not gonna work. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you don't just do things just because you can. You do things when it makes sense, when it's the right thing to do, and when you think that it can actually be a benefit. And, and also as well, you ha again, you have to do the work. Like, just in back to Lee's question as well, like how I started doing the kind of film and TV music actually was, you know, as a producer, as a music maker, you're always making beats, you're always making tracks, you're always making instrumentals, as well as doing writing sessions and things of that nature. So if you can imagine, over a kind of 10, 15 year period, how much music you have. At that particular time, I was very much doing the beat making thing. We're talking about the early 2000s and I was doing that a lot. So, you know, I would be, I had hundreds of beats lying around and um, I can't remember which friend it was, but it was just a friend that said, hey, I know this guy, he's looking for instrumentals. He's looking for music to place with TV and film. And you always hear about things like this, but you sometimes, don't know people that do. And I randomly was like, okay, well, let me send him some tracks, see what he says. He went crazy, he loved this stuff. He was like, oh, I could put this with this, I could put this with this. And then we kind of developed a relationship. So as well as just sending things that I already had, I would do bespoke things for sort of like commercials or short films or whatever. And it just opened up another kind of side of the industry for me that I hadn't explored. But again, it was a good skill because it's like, and you know, there's lots of things that I do from a music director sense that I actually draw back from that sort of like period of working in film and TV because I kind of like, even simple things like edits, do you know what I mean? When you're having to edit things for like a 30 second commercials and this and that, whatever, it's like, I feel like I can edit anything. So it's, <laughs> so it's like, if I have to, if, if I'm doing a record and they're like, oh, well we need to do, you know, it's like a simple thing. You might be doing a, a Jonathan Ross and they say like, oh, well, Kojo, we need to do a two minute version of this song. I think, okay, great. Like in my head, I straight away pop back to, you know, commercial days, you know what I mean? And, and figuring out how to do edits and this and that, whatever. And of course, like now I have certain things that I know what to do and how I'm gonna do to shorten things. But like, that's an example of how different skills you build up along the way then become useful in ways that you you know you never would have thought they would have been useful. Yeah, on that point, and I will, I'm going to hand over now and see if anyone's got any questions. But the whole transferable skills thing is a massive discussion in education, you know. And it's one of the good things important. about getting people like yourself in is to is to kind of you know give people a bit of an insight as to you know. Of course, we all might start off wanting to be the big rock star or the big hotshot producer, but if you can't do that, instead of going to get the job outside the music industry. Where can I apply these skills? That, that's a big thing. Um, so in regards to sort of, let's just say, I mean, obviously not knowing whether you have been to a university and graduated, but when you get to a point where you go, okay, I've accumulated these skills and this knowledge, what do I do? So for a lot of these guys, and actually a lot of them are on a two-year accelerated program, so they don't even get the three years. And obviously while you're at university and places like that, you will be building up connections and a bit of a network anyway. But for a lot of these guys, the end of their program comes around really quickly. Mm. And then it's like, okay, what do I do? So for those that maybe haven't built up stuff that they can kind of start to develop straight away, what would you say to somebody who's just graduated, they've got musical skills, what, what are they gonna do? I think that um, initially, and this is kind of, it pains me to say it, but I think that like getting your socials together is kind of really important. You know, it really is whatever that's going to be, whether that's going to be Instagram or SoundCloud or, you know, a web page or whatever. But essentially all those things now are like, 
I see them more as, C they, they're like digital CVs, you know, as well as having CVs and things like that. But you need to set yourself up like a business and like, like it's something that you're doing for real. So again, that includes things like LinkedIn and whatnot. And I think that having all that really professional, not like pictures of you up on a Friday night, like drinking and partying or whatever, just like as much of a kind of a digital CV as possible, you need to have that all together so that when, because everybody, the minute they talk to you now, now, I had to do it like a couple of years ago because I didn't care about that stuff. But I realized that like the minute anybody says anything, the first thing they want to do is click and find out about you. You know, so you have to make sure that all of that is kind of together. And the thing about the music business to me is that it's really, really wide. There's like a zillion different things you can do. And you really need to have an idea of what it is that you want to focus on. So I think finding that out is really, really important. I think the challenge we have with the music industry is it's still the wild, wild west. Do you know what I mean? So it's like, you know, having a degree in production doesn't mean that you can walk up and get on the next Ed Sheeran record. Do you know what I mean? Or having a songwriting degree doesn't mean that you're going to, you know, it, it doesn't mean anything. So really everything actually comes from what you're going to actually build and what you're going to create. So it's important to set yourself up as a company be professional about it and then just start trying to engage you start trying to kind of you know once once you know what area of the business you want to go into you know start trying to connect with people that are in those areas that are in those places well actually and then at the end of this question i will then hand over back to tjen or anyone else that really nicely moves into you know you said like socials you know there was a time where particularly in certain like areas of the music industry, people didn't really care to talk about their brand. But now everyone talks about their brand. And it's certainly something that sort of runs through the music industry management course, mm. you know, um, and of course your brand can mean lots of things. Mm. So I guess for you now, um, you know, even just me looking at your website earlier, even if I hadn't heard any of your work, it says something to me before I read anything, before mm. I listen to anything that you've done. Mm. So is that is that important for you in regards to, how you portray yourself online, knowing that anyone can find anything out about you at any point if they want I th to. I think, I think it's become more and more important. Like I said, it's like all that kind of rebranding. I actually, I only did that like maybe two, three years ago most, because literally like most of my work has come word of mouth and, and based on reputation. So I've been really, really lucky in the respect that like, I've never actually had to get, try and get a gig. Do you know what I mean? I've never actually sent out any, the live music has really come very naturally to me. And I've never really had to kind of um, do anything in order to get the work. But um, what happened was I started realizing that as the sort of age group of maybe even some of the managers that I work with, um, you know, the first thing that anybody wants to do is check out your socials. That's the first thing they do. It's like it doesn't they, they don't know about some of the acts. If, you know, it's like, oh, you did Jesse J. They might not really remember Jesse J like that. Do you know what I mean? Or you did Plan B. Oh, you know, even if they know him, they didn't see the show. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Even if I'd say, you know, they, they didn't see. They don't know. They only know what's going on right now. So they need to be able to plug into things. And I realized, you know what? I have to get this together. And it is really important to have. But I think it's really important to try and you know, you have to, I think the, the deep thing about it is you have to put as much thought into that as you would into the creative side of things too, because it's like, you know, you can overdo it sometimes too. I see people that have these amazing brands, but they ain't done nothing. Do you know what I mean? It's so a you shame, isn't it, that it, that's what's kind of happened for a lot of people, for sure. Yeah, but like, it, but it's a, it's a catch-22 because it's like, you know, you don't do anything. People are like, oh, what are you kind of doing? But then sometimes people will send me stuff and their brand and everything that they're doing is so good. I'm like, what do they want from me? Like, shit, like, I'm, I need to get with you. Do you know I mean? Because they'll be like, oh, I'm a producer. I'm an MD. I've done this. I've done that. I'm thinking to myself, wow, what, you got any work? Like, what's popping? Like, you, you know, so I think that some, and, and they'll be like 22, you know, so it's kind of like you have to get a balance. Like, from my point of view, I would prefer somebody to be like, I'm honest, I'm new to this, I'm trying to learn or whatever. Mm. I, I, I prefer an honest approach rather than somebody making me think that, you know, they've done a zillion things by their 23rd birthday. Because I think to myself, like, if somebody's done too much, too young, I think to myself, well, they either got fired a lot or they've been on a lot of bad projects. You know what I'm saying? So I think that, like, you really you get in the balance of how you present yourself. It's really, really important because you have to also think about 
who you're presenting yourself to. Like everybody doesn't like share the same ideals. So to give you a, for instance, like sometimes it's like, it's a catch 22. Sometimes people will think that, okay, I need to get on my social. So I need to like, say like you're a drummer. Drummers might be like, okay, I need to put up lots of clips of me drumming, right? Which, yeah, I get that. But like somebody like me, I don't really see much value in that a lot of the time. I think it looks good on Instagram, but it's like, I need to see what somebody plays like with a band. Do you know what I mean? Like, like for me, it doesn't matter how somebody plays on their own because that's recorded. It's just, I can see that it's all neat and tidy. It's really more beneficial for me to see somebody in a live performance or yeah, giving their honest sort of thing <laughs> across. Yeah, yeah. I need to know you got a groove. You know what I mean? It's all well and good playing on your own, but playing on your own is not grooving with other musicians. So, but the, again, that's just me. Somebody else might be like, oh, he looks great. Yeah, let's get him. So, so, so it's, it's, you know, but it's, but I, you know, again, I think that like, I think you have to approach all these things with a certain authenticity and a certain desire to be real. Don't think that you can kind of trick people or get over on people or, do you know what I mean? I would rather see somebody do something on, for example, just, I'd rather see somebody do something that's rough and they messed up than see something that's uber perfect that I know has been edited and yeah, it looks yeah. really pretty and look whatever, because you can't tell anything from that, you know? Great. TJ. You kind of gave us a brief, a, a brief background about your journey towards that. Yes. When did you find yourself taking on the responsibility? Did it accumulate in, in little increments or was it suddenly, whoa, I got Stormzy and I'm the musical director at this <laughs> massive festival. Like, and once I get an idea basically of how you found that role, mm -hmm. it would also be nice to know what, what a typical, like say you've got a big show, Mm -hmm. how you're a day in the life of a music, like what would your day consist of? What is the itinerary? Turn sure. up, wake in. So how did you get into that role? Then what does that role consist of when you're actually actively engaged in it? Okay, sure. So, okay, so I was, um, as I explained, I was producing. I, I, after, after a while, I, I was working on projects and some of the artists that would come into my studio had started saying to me like, oh, we got these gigs. They would, they'd see me playing in the studio and they'd be like, oh, do you want to come out and do some gigs? And I'd be like, no. And they'd be like, no, just come, it'll be fun. And you know, I just, long story short, I just started doing them, you know what I mean? I started enjoying it. People started seeing me. I was, I think that like my energy, my vibe was a little bit different to some of the other people. And I was coming from like a very technical sound sort of background. So I was able to bring that into the live things I would do. And I got on to a pop gig, you know, um, it seems like, like basically there was an audition. A friend of mine said, hey, um, Sugar Babes are looking for a keyboard player that I think you'd be right for. Sugar Babes were a big pop band at the time. I, I don't know if people know them, but they're kind of yeah, like- Yeah, Yeah, all of those. Yeah, yeah, kind of like what Little Mix is now, or whatever, but like they were a big band. And what actually happened, which was interesting, which is how things tied together, they had just done an album that was produced by Dallas Austin. Dallas Austin is a producer who produced TLC, um, people like that. And his production style was kind of pop R&B, which was kind of similar to my production style. So it's like the person, the friend of mine that recommended me for the gig, it was because they were trying to get a bit more of a bit more, lack of a better term, R&B type of sound, a bit more of an American type of feel. To, the, to what they were doing. They wanted to bring that energy into the bands. So they were looking for somebody to do that. They said, go audition. I went and auditioned. I got the gig. I was still a producer at the time, but I just thought, you know what? Let me just see how this goes and I'll take it from there. And basically within six months, I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna do this for a minute because it was like, I kind of looked at the situation and I thought to myself, this is really straightforward, you know, in terms of like, I'd always been somebody that had to create something out of nothing, whereas this is something that was already created. There was a band, there was an artist, there was touring. All they wanted you to do was come in, play the songs, mimic the sounds from the record and play. And I was like, shit, this is easy. I'll do this every day. And you were getting paid every day. Do you know what I mean? This isn't like when you're sort of like producing, do you know what I mean? Or writing, because you're not getting money while you're producing and writing unless things make the album and then you get paid. So it's like, it seemed to be a good way, it seemed to be a good vocation. And, um, and I just kind of jumped into it and I kind of learned everything about the live music industry really from that gig. I didn't know anything about it 
at that point in time. Like I remember them, I remember being in the room with the musicians and they were like, oh, he's your monitor engineer. And I was like, what the hell are you talking about? And it's like, no, he does your monitors. I'm like, what are monitors? I, I, I know studios. <laughs> I was like, I did. So um, I learned everything about it um, on the job in terms of like, and I, the, I was working for an MD. I saw what he did and straight away I was like, oh, this is like. I yeah, well, I, no, I didn't think that at all. I just, rec I thought, oh, it's like producing a band. I didn't want to do that because I'd been in charge of things since I was 18 years old. So it was nothing was for me to just come in and just play and then leave. I was like, oh my God, this is a, this is a piece of cake. Like, I don't believe how easy this is. So um, I just tried to do a good job on the gig. It's literally, I just tried to add value, play, program the sounds, do whatever. And I was on that project for about four years. And at the end of that, the, the other musicians in the band went to do another gig. They asked me to stay on and be like the road MD. So that's the guy that kind of, the, the main MD was still there, but I was to become the guy that helped out. You know, the MD couldn't be there a lot. They asked me to put together another band. And I was like, okay, it was a very safe environment because I'd been with that team for a number of years. So I just then started doing it, but I was observing the role the whole time. The MD is a guy named Mike Stevens, who's amazing. He um, he was the MD, well, still is, for people like Take That and Annie Lennox and people of that nature. And I just kind of learned under him. Um, for a couple of years, I just kind of shadowed what he did, tried to learn it. And um, long story short, I, I was then, I, be, I then became Sugar Babe's MD. And um, they were a big band, you know, they were a big band at the time. So it's like you do a few good performances and people are like, oh, hey, so who's the MD? And, um, and, I, get, and I started getting other offers. And that's how that kind of, my kind of MD in career, for lack of a better term, took off kind of exponentially from there. Brilliant. So you started off in that, it evolved very naturally from- Very let me, naturally. Let me just play the keys here, and recreate the sounds of the record with a group of free girls. But I wasn't, yeah, but I wasn't, but I wasn't in charge of the sound. I was just a keyboard player. So at that yeah, point in time, I'm just mean, like- And then more and more responsibility falls upon you, but it feels natural. It feels easy. This is a climate that I can, I can do this. So, okay. So we got there. Now, I imagine this question will vary depending on what acts you're working with. And uh, guys, I am going to come to you for your questions in a sec. But I imagine this varies depending on who you're working with. But what kind of software is involved when it comes to being a musical director? Like, typically, is there any kind of consistent, like, I'm always opening up Logic at some point. Um, I, I have this special audio software that I use. I, I, I even, I, I bring an Excel spreadsheet with me everywhere. What is it that when you, do you pop open a laptop and get your tech out? What happens? Well, everybody's different. I'm very technically orientated because as you would have gathered by now, I've been using software and, you know, I've been using sequences and samplers and whatnot since they were first made, <laughs> like literally. So like, I'm very kind of technically orientated, but yeah, there's no particular, there's no particular way to do it. There's no one way to skin a cat. So what I mean by that is like, I might do a lot of my own programming. There might be another music director that doesn't do any programming and they just, they just, they're just musicians and they just tell other people what to play. But for me, I, I use Ableton now and I use, you know, the same software that everybody else uses, you know, um, UAD, <laughs> you know, in terms of plugins, um, Sound Toys, you know, Slate Digital, um, you know, just the regular Melodyne, just regular production tools. But these are tools that I use because I kind of activate in that kind of way. Do you, do you know what I mean? But you don't need, but you could use Logic, you can lose Fruity, you could use whatever makes sense. Um, I have used different things at different times. I just happen to use Ableton now because I think it's the most stable. I like it the most. I think it's one of the most creative. And yeah, I, I use that. But again, I, th I feel like the tools are irrelevant because it's like the tools can change from person to person. You know, it's more kind of like what you're using them for. And ultimately, it's just whatever is going to help you kind of make this show the best it can be uh, is the most important thing. All right. Okay. So at this point, I'm going to throw it out there. Um, let me put it on speaker view. So the person asking the question is on blast. That's how we <laughs> going to do. And see if the first question is about money. No, no, it's <laughs> not really good. good. It's not Lee, let, let, let's let them, uh, MP, MP, take your thing off mute. You had the philosophical pose. We're ready. <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to unmute you. 
Done there it? We go. Yep, you're there. You're there. Why don't you throw your question out there? It was a nice one, a bit of a technical one. Go with it. Hi, Kojo. How are you doing? I'm good. Ah! <laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> well, I thought, you know, saves a lot of questions bombarding you, mate. Sorry if I'm embarrassed. You just message but... me. I mean, <laughs> I know, but I, I've loved this. But anyway. Um, How are you doing? Yeah, good, mate. So, yeah, shall we just. Uh... Do they know each other by any chance, TJ? Yeah, we know each other. Potentially, I think potentially they might have some sort of rapport. I think so. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Or I look like someone, like, I don't know, meat, meatloaf or something. Right, well, basically, and I, I don't know if I've mentioned this to you before, but my question surrounds music theory. Mm -hmm. And um, obviously you're an arranger, composer, you create. Um Sometimes I don't know whether you think it helps or hinders because once you find out there's a particular mode or something that evokes a particular emotion, it could be a go-to, et cetera. Um, so first question is, what was your journey with music theory? I.e., did you study or did you just learn like in a practical sense by year and as you went along? Mm -hmm. And how much does it affect your job, basically? Okay, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that so... Growing up, I did a mixture of both. Um, initially, by ear, just because I was surrounded by instruments. My family were all musicians, so I was, there would always be something, oh, let me jump on that, or let me jump on that, or let me whatever. But um, as I got a little bit older, I wanted to get proper lessons and learn, you know what I mean? So I had like piano teachers, I think, I think maybe when I was 14, I think I decided, yeah, piano was the one I liked the most because I had been doing a bit of everything else. So I had piano lessons. I did it at GCSE level. I did it at A-level level. level um, a yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, <laughs> but actually, the funny thing is, is that, yes, yeah, so it was always a mixture of studying and, um, and also by ear. But at that particular time, what I was really interested in was putting music together, really like producing music. And how you have things like Point Blank now, they, they, those type of schools, they didn't exist when I was doing it. So everything that I was doing at that particular time, I was just, I was just doing myself from reading manuals and learning how to do it. And even from, but music theory, I was studying music theory, I was studying piano, all of that. But as I sort of got to A-level sort of age, which is like 16, 17, I just realized I was more into constructing music than playing music. So I actually studied composition um, as opposed to performance. So at that particular time, I was very um, theoretical and I would score music and things of that nature. And I added that to, you know, me just being able to just jam and play chords and play music too. So I, I kind of had a mixture of both, um, but only up to sort of like a level level because at that particular time you either had to go and do jazz or you had to go and do classical simple as that and i didn't want to do just singly any one of those i think if it was anything i would have been more likely to go on the classical route funnily enough but i really just wanted to make music so i just started doing that but um in regards to how useful it is in my job now it's like it's funny because I was always a musical producer and then become and then actually moving into the live thing. I've always had a certain musicality, which is important, but it's like you're not sharp. Do you know what I mean? So what I mean by that is like I think from I think from when I handed in my final score at A level, I don't think I've seen a score since. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? So it's like like nobody's ever put a piece of music in front of me and said, "Oh, we want you to read this. You want you, but it's like so for me, in working in kind of contemporary music, I wouldn't say it's as important as really having a good ear and knowing what it is that you want. But there's been occasions to whereby having some theoretical knowledge has been really important because it's like, let's say you're working with an artist, you know, it could be like a female artist or whatever, and, we're go and this has happened, like you might be going to the States to do you know, an award show and there's gonna and there's an orchestra there and there's a composer that's arranged something and you're the musical director and they'll be like, so Kojo, are you gonna look at the score? And it's like, yes I am. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, it's good to be able to look at it and say, okay, actually, I, you know, I'm not an expert, but I think, okay, yeah, maybe bar 47, I don't like that part. And, and I'll be using a mixture of kind of my, my 
ears, but also knowing a little bit of the technical, and it doesn't make me look like a complete dickhead to the, <laughs> to the artists that I'm with. They're like, because they, 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 you know, that would be like, what? You don't know what? You don't know anything about music? <laughs> and it's like, but honestly, I would say it's it's really not that important, you know. And even now, it's like the funny thing is, as a music director, people don't even some people don't even know that I play. Do you know what I mean? Like some people aren't even aware that I can actually play keyboards because when I decided to do the MD role, because I have this production background, it was very easy for me to jump into that type of role. So a lot of MDs would usually be people that played in the band and just say, okay guys, what we're gonna do is da da da, you know, but I kind of just approached it a different way that kind of made sense for me. And people have just accepted that, which is great. But with that and kind of like a lot of times, like I said, people like, there's been times when I'll go up to the keyboard and do something and be like, oh, okay, we didn't know you played. So, so I, I, I don't think it's important. I think always what's most important is the end result of anything. Nobody cares how you got anywhere. All they care about is the end result. Kojo, I've got a vision of a musical director who's clearly blagged it, has <laughs> now got a hundred piece orchestra and <laughs> someone at the venue has handed in some sheet music. And he's, just like, he's just like, uh, yeah, yeah, this looks good. Yeah. Let me hear Ooh. you guys play this first and I'll give, you an, I'll give you an interpretation with my ears. Exactly that. But you know what, but I would say like that's maybe like two, three times in a 25 year career. So I don't think it's important. And I think it's- You, know, some, you know someone's done that recently. Of course, you know of they're, course. They're beads of sweat dropping down their head as they've been handed sheet music and are like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. I don't even know what's going on here. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but so I guess knowledge is power in that regard. At least if you know it, you know it. You know you can't get better to know than not to know. Um, <laughs> thank you, Carla. Carla, thank you. Thanks very much for your question, MP. Carla's got the kind of question my dad would ask if I'm ever involved in anything. It's the first thing he asked. The double question. Go on, give us, give us the dad question. <laughs> so, what's your cut in a project? How much money would you get? How much percentage? Oh, well, you don't get a percentage. I wish I got a percentage. Um, <laughs> what I would say is like, as it, I actually think, honestly, I actually think that this is a problem. But like, <laughs> most people in the live music industry, including music directors, are paid in what you call a day rate sort of rate. So musicians, music directors, tour managers, lighting people, everybody are paid per day. So my, my day rate, it obviously, it varies depending on what it is I'm doing, but essentially I charge per day per project. So for example, if, if I'm rehearsing a band for two weeks, I get paid for that two weeks pay. I go on a few days of tour, I get paid a few days and then that's it. But I do think that like, honestly, I think that with the MD role, you know, you kind of take on this role and then you're kind of like a full-time consultant <laughs> or as well. <laughs> and it's like, you're not actually paid for those times when you're consulting on the project. So for me personally, I try to have a day rate that reflects not just what I'm getting paid for the day that I'm working, but also for the times when you're gonna call me at 10 a.m. at night and need something or 3 a.m. in the morning and that's something gonna need to be sent to, you know, a TV station or whatever. So, you know, it's, it's basically like that. So with that, your kind of income year to year can vary. Can I, can I, can I ask you in, in, a, in another way of phrasing that question? Would you say the pay is reflective of the effort and therefore is the pay good? I mean, that's quite a wide question within the music business in general, really. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, I would have to say that for the most part, I feel good about what I've managed to be able to get over the years. But a big part of that has been that like, I would say that my, re my rate has maybe increased over the years, over many, many years. And also I work a lot, I, you know, well, not now, <laughs> but usually I work quite a bit. So I'm able to get to the end of the year and say, oh, actually, you know what? This, this, this is not really too bad considering, you know what I mean? But I could also say that I think that, um, I think that for live touring musicians in general, live touring crew, live touring personnel, it would be great if there was more money um, because it is, um, here, here. But, but you know, but, but to be fair, but I think that's across the board. I think that like, that's across the, I don't think there's anybody in the music business that's not wishing 
there was more money apart from maybe, you know, labels who have a lot of money and artists who can make a lot of money. You know I'm I mean? afraid even the labels with all the money still want more money. Yeah. Everybody wants more money, but I still think that it comes down to the fact that I think that, you know, I think that I was having a conversation with a musician in particular. And be, to, honestly, being a musician in MD, any of that, it's not really any different. And I think that what anybody wants in any job is they want to be able to see progression. So if you're working for 10 years, you want to be able to, you want to be making more money at year 10 than you were at year one. And you also want to be able to get basic things that people want to be able to afford. You know, a house, a car, uh, get married, whatever it is that you want to do. So I think that if you can't do that, there's really, really a big problem. And I think that there's a bit of an issue that I think that within the industry, for a lot of live musicians, there's kind of a glass ceiling. There's like a number at which that like very few people can kind of get beyond. And that's, I think, a long-term problem, really. And I mean, all I want is a private jet, a Ferrari and a helipad. I mean, God, man, and a 25 bedroom mansion. I mean, please, like, I'm not asking for much, man. Just pay me what I deserve, damn it. Um, <laughs> I, love, I, love, I love Carla's question. Carla's question, like, the reason I call it dad question is because it's like the kind of thing where you come back and say, man, I did this gig. There was like 5,000 people going mad. I was killing it. I was in my vibe. I was doing it. I was so, like, you would be so proud. And he would be just like, yeah, but how much did it pay? <laughs> no, but you know what though? But I think it's a really good question and a really relevant question because I think that like, again, like I, I, I um, I work across a few different things. I work with the Ivers Songwriter Committee as well, so I'm kind of in contact with a lot of songwriters and producers also. And what people are getting paid, or what, what they're actually getting from their work, is actually a really big issue at the moment because, you know, with the way streaming, streaming royalties are divided, there's a lot less money um, available for producers and songwriters and things of that nature. So, you know, I would say across the business in general, though, I think that one of the good things about the live music industry is that you're paid for your time. So the value of your time is going to vary depending upon your experience le levels and whatnot. But, you know, you are paid for your time. So I think as a vocation, I think it's a great one. And that's one of the reasons why I kind of stepped into it and kind of stayed with it. Because I would say when I was producing, you might, you know, you can, you, you can do 29 demos for 29 different albums and nothing gets on. And there's no money for that while you're doing it, you know. And it's like maybe you get three or four cuts out of 50 songs that you do. And it's like they're album cuts. <laughs> that's not going to move the dial financially. And these, these days, it's really not. So, um, and actually, it's just worth me saying for the, you know, a lot of you guys in the audience that are building up a lot of skills that you can apply to lots of different areas. And obviously, you know, Koji just saying about the live, you know, I spent nearly 20 years touring and a lot of the times we would go on tour knowing that we had to, to promote a record. Mm -hmm. And the only people coming away with money were people like, like, you know, the rest of the team, not me as a band <laughs> member, but, you know, uh, tour managers, production managers, sure. But also sometimes we do a tour with three session musicians. They would be paid their daily rate minimum, you know, uh, uh, and even if even if nobody bought tickets, the fact that we had to hire them. So, you know, definitely in regards to going, I want to be that person doing the thing up front. But if I can't, what other things can I do which might you know present opportunities for sure? Well, 100 percent. And like you're saying, it's like, you know, even just sometimes crew, you know, Jesus, like. I, you know, so, you know, at the end of the day, like if somebody works crew, you know, you're basically living the exact same lifestyle as the musicians or the, or, you know, you're getting pretty much the same money. Do you know what I mean? It's kind of like there are other things you can do outside of just being a musician or an MD or a session player, whatever it is. And again, I think that like, you know, like I was talking about programming earlier, I think that for actual um what they call playback text, there's like a huge need for people to run playback now. Because like I was describing, there's lots of shows these days that don't even use a band. Do you know what I mean? So it's like having people that know software, that know computers, that can put tracks together, that can do edits. I mean, those guys are making great money. And like I've said, it's exactly the same as anything else. You're paid for your time. And I think that um, it, obviously you're working in the service industry, but it's still, um, it's not. It's, it's definitely something something to consider, and and all, and I get and, and again, I think that from my point of view, you know, it's it's a vocation like many other vocations in the industry, and you just kind of go with it when you can, you know. Great. Uh, have we got any more questions, TJ? 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got a question here from Bastian. Bastian, sit, man. Hey. <laughs> What's good, Bastian? What's uh, cooking in that kitchen, man? Uh, nothing, unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I have one question. Um, Kojo, I love your arrangements. And um, I had the question um, when you were working with uh, Sugar Babes um, and uh, you were working with uh, Mike Stevens, who was um, the MP then. Yes. And you, you were um, having the responsibility as a keyboard player and he was working as the MD. And my question was, um, what were the most important lessons you learned by him and how have they affected your workflow till today? Well, it's interesting because, like, as I said, he was the first MD I'd worked under. And, yeah, I think that for me, it was just seeing what the job was. You know, it was literally just seeing, oh, okay, so he tells me what to play and he tells me if I'm playing too much and oh and he has he tells that guy you know he, you know and just seeing how he orchestrated just watching how he did everything it kind of showed me a role um, and um, yeah it, it just it just gave me a vision of something that I didn't know existed because at that particular time I had no idea that there was music directors and you could make money doing this so literally just by observing the way he did things And then from my point of view, in terms of how it influenced the way I worked, I think one of the things that Mike had at that particular time was he was like the main guy. <laughs> like at that particular, he was like the, and he was really organized. It's just basically, his bands were just always really together, really tight, really tidy, really professional, things of that nature. So I tried to kind of like, initially, I just tried to do that, present, bring good people to the table that would behave the right kind of way, that did the right kind of things. And yeah, and that's just how I just how to kind of do it in a in the, in the industry was what I learned from him. But I think that the fortunate thing for me is that I was going into music directing as somebody that had already kind of produced music for 15 years. So from a creative perspective, I then started, okay, now I understand the game. Let me see what I can do to it. Let me see what I can kind of how I can kind of do what I do. And it's probably, you know, and, it, and that just kind of developed over time. So I think that initially as an MD, I would see my role as to kind of just deliver the record. But it got to a point in time when I realized it's like, okay, for me, that's like MD 101. It's like after that, it's like, all right, now they want something else. Like they, 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 they need more. And it's kind of like, okay, how can I give more? And what, what, what else can I do? What can I bring to the table when artists, come to you and they're like, oh, I want something more exciting. And I think that obviously we live in a time when Beyonce is one of the biggest artists in the world. So people want, people want that energy, people want that. So it's like, I started developing more and more my own approaches. Uh, but for me, I've always been somebody that's into lots of different kind of music. You know, I've grown up around rock musicians. I've grown up around jazz musicians. I've grown up around funk musicians. I've grown up in hip hop. So it's like, I've always liked lots of different things. So I don't approach any show the same. Like I, I've always made it a big thing to work cross genre. So if I'm working with a Stormzy, it's going to be a completely different thing than with a Jess Glenn. Or if I'm working with a Jess Glenn, it'll be a diff completely different thing than if I'm helping out with a Tom O'Dell. Or if I'm doing something like that, it's completely different than if I'm doing something with a Jade Bird or, you know, or I don't know, like a Jesse Ware. It's like they're all different. So what I really try and do is when I'm working with an artist, I try and tailor what I'm doing to what they have and then just bring some kind of flavor in it. But, you know, but it's like you have to do that within the context of each artist. What each artist wants is different. You know, some artists want a lot. Some people want you to not mess with their music. <laughs> I have a question here from Simon. Uh, Simon is also a musical director, as it, ha as it happens. Where is this Simon? Uh, well, Simon is not in the correct space to visually present himself on camera. Uh. <laughs> however, right. however, Simon, are, I will take silence as a no, but are you in the position to speak to us audibly and present your question <laughs> without the camera? Can we go with that, Simon? Can you speak without using your camera? Or Unfortunately is, not. Oh dear. Obviously, Simon's antics are so, so hideous right now that he can't <laughs> even turn on his microphone. Wow. <laughs> so I'll ask it for him. What's your involvement like when the band's on tour? You mentioned you might be on tour for a few days. What sort of things would you be up to on those days? 
And I don't want to know the dirty details because <laughs> we all yeah, you know do. what happens on tour stays on tour. <laughs> but I mean, in a professional context, Coach, just me in a professional context. Well, I mean, your role initially is to, is you're trying to put together a show. So let's forget, let's say whether it's a 30 minute show or an hour show or two hour show, whatever, you're putting together a show. So that's your kind of primary kind of job is to put together a show and a performance that is in line with what the artist wants, what the management want, and everybody's happy with. Once you've kind of done that, you're kind of like obsolete. <laughs> it's kind of like you're kind, you're kind, you know, particularly if you've kind of got everything, everything's programmed, everything's set to run. You know, one of the people that want a music director, they want things to be set up in a way that they run. So once that's kind of done, the only reason you're going for the first few shows is because let's say you have a set list and you haven't performed the set list yet. So you need to see the first show to see if the set list works. It might be problems. It might be like the show might not run right. So even though you've rehearsed it, you see it with the crowd. So it might be like, nah, do you know what? We need to cut that song and we need to put another one in and we need to, so it's like you do a little bit of tweaking and when it's at that stage, everybody's like, yeah, this is the one that works. It's like, bye-bye. <laughs> see, and, and that's really it. And also it might be things like, if, you're, if it's a bigger show, you're, you're hearing the show not just in a rehearsal room, you're hearing it in the actual arena or in the actual theater. So you need to kind of have input in the mix. You need to, at that point, I might be more at front of house with the front of house engineer and be like, oh, we need a little bit more of this here, we need a little bit less of that there. You know, all these kind of technical things to make sure that what's coming out and what people are gonna see on this tour is what we've been rehearsing. Um, but once that's all kind of established and set, you know, you're not really needed because you've put together the show. Let's say that it's a festival run. They might get to a point where there might be a situation where mid-festival run, they might be like, ah, oh, do you know what? The artist might be like, I really want to add a cover. So maybe we'll come in and rehearse a cover and then we'll add that. Or they might be like, something isn't really working and I might come and see, or it might be there's like something that's on TV. So it might be like, I need to go and supervise the broadcast mix, but you're just in and out. But the majority of the work is done and you're only gonna get called when it's not working again. So for example, like, let's say you do that festival run, and then after that festival run, let's say there's a tour in the autumn. So that tour is not gonna be exactly the same as the festival. So you're then reworking it then. So you're just in and out depending on what's needed. I've got one last question that I'd like to wrap up on. You talked about Spotify shows, you know, as in, <laughs> and I, I like that expression and I get it. And it made me think about performers on a budget, mm. yeah? i.e. myself. So you go on stage, you haven't got a crew, you haven't got all of the resources to tap into, but you want to do a show that's super cool, that shows a bit more creativity. Mm. How do you ball on a budget? Well, I mean, everybody's got a computer. You know, that's, that's the whole thing. Everybody's got a computer. It's kind of like, sometimes it's just kind of thinking about things a little bit more. At the end of the day, it's like, Again, like for example, like, okay, let's say how I'm talking about backing tracks, for example. It's like, okay, maybe, maybe for a big performance, I want it to be eight channels and this and that, whatever, but it could just be stereo backing track. It, at the end of the day, it can just be a stereo track that you use, but it's about what you put into it. So like I said, you just like, you know, you got a computer, you know, you got tracks, try and put them together, try and do stuff. Like think about how I can make it more interesting. Like don't just think like, oh, I got these tracks, let me just play them. Think like, okay, well, what order am I gonna play them in? Why am I gonna do it that way? Well, how's it gonna go from that song to, how's it gonna feel if I go from that song to that song to that song? Can, can I do anything there to keep that energy going? Like just actually think about the show as in, in thinking about it as a show, not just as like, these are the songs because they're not, that's two different things. So it's, as I said, I don't think like, I don't think it's an expect, it's expense things. I think that like, I just think that all these kind of like technological things are just tools, but essentially it's ideas. Ideas are really like the most important commodity in this game period, really. And you gotta have some. So, you know, whatever tools you have to kind of mess around with those ideas, do that. And like I said, I think in this day and age, everybody's pretty much got a computer. So it's like, you know, at, very, at the very least, you know, you can set up something on computer that you end up bouncing out as a two track and you have a 30 minute show. Do you know what I mean? It's literally just, you know, maybe your first two songs or three songs put together. And then, you know, it's like, there's more than one way to do it. You know, so I've just, I've just chucked your socials in the, the chat for anyone that's interested. We had people in the comments saying, how do we get in touch with you? How do we, 
I've put your email and your socials, uh, your yeah, Instagram, content. Kojo yeah. Music Official. From my public point of view, really insightful, really useful, a pleasure. Uh, you just got also a very fantastic demeanor, the kind of guy that you just sit down and just having a chat with you is kind of cool. The, the time just kind of flies away and you're just like, wow, this is really cool and interesting. I'm, I'm, I'm a huge admirer of how you've presented yourself online of what you've achieved, what you're, what, what you're continuing to achieve in your career. I think it's fantastic. And I, I really appreciate the knowledge that you've shared and imparted with those that are in attendance. Judging from the comments that we're having here, I feel like everyone really truly appreciates it as well. I don't know if you have any final words or if Lee wants to say anything, but I guess from my point of view, I just want to say thanks very much, Kojo. That was a pleasure and I hope to have you when we can invite you into the physical space again. I know you're in the Point Blank Studios now, but when we can maybe have you in the same physical space as our students, that would also be fantastic as well. We should get a nice big sort of practical session going where you can get some gear up and running, get some stems up, have, yeah. you know, have some fun. That would yeah, be good for sure. Happy to do that. Yeah, that will be dope. Now, listen, I've really enjoyed it. I've had a good time. Um, I'm really happy. If anybody's got any questions, I'm happy to answer. If you're shy, you can hit me up on social media or whatever like that. I'm pretty bad at it, but still, <laughs> give me a shout. But um, yeah, like I said, I've really enjoyed it. And like I said, if anybody has any questions, please don't be shy. I just had one last one to finish on because this is one I like to ask a lot of people. So this could be going back at a point where you can recognize like a person or it could be sort of more recently. But is there one person that you think that is that the kind of key person in your professional network that you, like the go-to, it could be a mentor, it could be your accountant, it could be anyone who's like the most important person that helps and supports you probably more than anyone else? Ooh. Um, what? Could be a friend, could be a parent. Professional, you know, professionally? Yeah, I guess so. Well, or, or, or just in regards to your, your, your circle, Obviously, these days, people talk a lot about your well-being. You know, people like to have that sort of close person. It could be family, it could be a mentor, or, or it could be like a personal assistant that you pay for, anything. Who's the most important? I, mean, I, I would, you know, I think you'd have to say the most important is always your family, because it's your family who you're with at home. Do you know what I mean? So I think I take a lot of strength from my family, my wife, my mother, my daughter, my son. It's like, I think, you know, those are all normal things, your family. They they always support you and they're with you. But I think that like, because I've grown up in such a musical household, like when I'm at home, music is kind of like one of the last things I'm kind of into <laughs> in terms of discussing. So it's almost like the, my music career is a slightly different type of thing, if that makes any sense. Like, um, so I think in terms of the people that support, I just think that it's really important to stress how much of a, um, a team sport it all is, you know. I think it really, it's important that you have good relationships with, with different managers. I think different people at labels. I think that having a good accountant, you know, financial advisors, all those things are really, really important because it's like, we live in a, you know, like this, this business is not really, it's not really there to help you. you you're the business, <laughs> that's the whole thing. You're the business, and I think that's the thing that we find difficult to really understand, but you are the business, so you have to think of yourself like Apple or Tesla, like how, how am I actually running this business? And I think that if you're not doing that, you know, you can have issues long term. So I think that it's like, it's really just appreciating the team of all the people around, you know, and, it's, and, and, the, and the musicians that you work with as well, they're, they're all really, Everybody is important to the whole thing. It's, it's, it's really difficult to say one is such, you know what I mean? Because I think in different projects, you kind of rely on everybody. There might be, you know, yeah, it's, it's everybody. It's the band, it's the crew, it's the tech. It's, it's everybody. It really, really is important. Teamwork. Great. Thank you ever so much, Kojo. No worries. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. Everyone's expressed their gratitude on there. Also, thanks to the content team that done the late shift to, to capture all this. It'll be on the YouTube. Keep looking out for our events. We've got um, Beyonce's dad's coming in. we got uh, Dr. Knowles is going to come in and talk about his career, like bringing up Beyonce, et cetera. We've got loads of stuff. Keep an eye on the events tab. I think we've got a full roster of events going all the way up till June. So stay tuned. Have a look. Get involved. Thanks for watching and check out pointblankmusicschool.com.